The Razorback offense will be better under Dan Enos, and Razorback basketball finally gets that dub. You are locked on Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. I am your host, John Neighbors. I am also the host of Out of Bounds. You can catch every weekday afternoon from 1 to 4 on 103.7 The Buzz and 1037thebuzz.com. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs, where they help you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. That's linkedin.com slash college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. Hope everybody had a wonderful weekend. As uh, I know, we'll have some uh, things to get into and some good news going on with some Razorback basketball finally getting a win, which I know people want to talk about. But I, I wanted to start off the podcast discussing a, uh, a thing with Dan Enos, because I know that that's been the topic of conversation for basically the past four or five days. And Arkansas has moved on from Kendall Brown. So no longer having that discussion anymore. You got to move forward now with Dan Enos. And the the question, or at least the discussion that's been had about Dan Enos and this Razorback football offense is, will it be better next year? Because as you know, listening to this podcast, I thought the Arkansas offense when KJ Jefferson was healthy this past season was really good. Uh, The numbers backed it up. The scoring was there. Arkansas with their difficulty of schedule and the amount of points that they were able to score again when KJ Jefferson was healthy was just incredible. I think that uh, at the end of the season, after 13 games, Arkansas averaged somewhere close to 38 points per game when K.J. Jefferson was healthy and 500 yards of offense per game. So those are the things that were really good. Arkansas did not turn the ball over a whole lot. They did have a few here and there, but uh, overall did not turn the ball over a ton. They uh, did deal with some injuries, and they did have some people obviously leave the program from this past year, and now – You have some new pieces getting added into this year. But the question becomes about Dan Enos now. Can Dan Enos make this offense better than what it was this past season? Can he put together certain things to make the offense take that next step forward? Essentially being the offense that Arkansas needs. Not the one that everyone's hoping it is, but the one that it needs to be able to win games, to finish games, and to have strong starts as well as great adjustments after halftime. Like those are the things that Arkansas's offense needs. Because here's the thing. You know you're going to have a very capable and high-quality quarterback in K.J. Jefferson. A guy who can run, a guy who can pass, a guy who has a lot of athletic ability and has proven that he can win and be competitive in this conference. you got Rocket Sanders, who is going to be – who is a great running back. Add in a whole lot of other running backs in there to add some depth. Add in some – uh, some guys that uh, you feel at the wide receiver position that are transferring in that uh, you have a lot of hope for. You know, there's things that you kind of know what you're going to get, at least at this point in time. And compared to what it was with Arkansas's offense last year, there's going to have to be some things that obviously change with Dan Enos. I don't think we're going to see the same type of formations. I don't think we're going to see the same type of approach to offense and a approach to the game plan, which – you know, might be a good thing. It might actually be something that this offense desperately needs because one thing that we do know about Dan Enos and what people have said about Dan Enos is that he is really good at taking what he has in an offense and making it work. And so I started looking at kind of his history uh, since he's been at Arkansas the first time around in 2015. And uh, I think Hog Sports did a great job of this too, kind of putting it into perspective as far as what he's done in his journey since being at Arkansas and uh, how he got to this point, too. Because we know in Arkansas in 2015 and 2016, Arkansas's offenses were really good, especially 2015, one of Arkansas's best offenses they ever had, ever. Uh, In fact, I I saw something that the highest scoring offense that Arkansas ever had was in 2011. And 2015 was second by just 11 points. So you're talking about 11-point difference between uh, that offense and uh, the offense from 2015. So we know that 2015, 2016 was really good. 2017 is really where... Uh, The wheels started falling off offensively and just the team itself under Brett Bielema. You had, uh, I think the team had obviously some major issues internally. You had Austin Allen who got hurt in that season and uh, wasn't the same. You had Cole Kelly come out. And it's crazy to think that the leading wide receiver that year was Jonathan Nance. Man, you talk about a name that I haven't heard or talked about in a long time. 
but you lost Raleigh Williams too for that season. So you, your starting quarterback was out for the majority of the year. You lost your best running back by far. Uh, you know, your wide receivers, uh, you, you, you're missing out on some guys because Drew, uh, Drew Morgan, as well as uh, Keon Hatcher ended up leaving. So it's just a bad deal. And we know that uh, Bielma got fired and then everybody else moved on. Well, from there, Dan Enos was a uh, offensive analyst at Michigan for a second until he was hired as Alabama's assistant head coach and quarterbacks coach. Alabama in 2018. You know who his quarterbacks were on that roster, don't you? Guys by the name of Tua Tagovailoa, Jalen Hurts, Mac Jones. It's pretty good. Uh, pretty good three guys who uh, just happen to all three be starting in the NFL right now. So we know how incredible that was. He was only there for a year, and he went on to take the offensive coordinator position with Manny Diaz in his first year at Miami. And when all that was going down, uh, he had retro freshman Jaron Williams. Had, uh, had a decent year with uh, 21, 87, 19 touchdowns, seven interceptions there too. Uh, but then he got benched, and then they had uh, Nikosi Perry come in, and he was he was also a pretty solid too. But there was a lot of issues going on where Miami was 10th in the ACC out of 14 teams, and they, there was obviously some issues. That uh, third down conversion rate was almost dead last in the country that year. Enos was fired by Manny Diaz, and then Diaz got fired two years later. So – that was kind of the exception to the rule where I don't think that was an Enos problem. It looked like it was more of a Manny Diaz problem because it was just, uh, yeah, it was it was not good from the get-go. And then he went to Cincinnati to be the running backs coach, which I thought was really fascinating because I forgot about this. And he had actually been a running backs coach at Michigan State from 07 to 09, so he had some experience there, and he was under Luke Fickle. So you had uh, the 2020 year, which was shortened. Uh, Cincinnati went 9-1 and one that year where their only loss came to Georgia in the Peach Bowl. And that year you had uh, uh, a two-headed system at running back and also Desmond Ritter at quarterback. The Bearcats finished second in the AAC in rushing yards per game of 212, and they also had 5.6 yards per carry, which led the conference. Um, so they had a really good stint as far as him being the running backs coach in that one year. But after he was there for one year, he became the OC at Maryland where uh, Arkansas ended up uh, getting him there uh, from there to come down here. In 2021, he was there under Mike Loxley, and uh, they were 3-9 uh, and nine in uh, Mike Loxley's year of his, his year three, where the Terrapins finished fourth out of 14 teams in the Big Ten with 441 yards and 30 points a game. So really elevated their offense. Talia Tagovailoa was uh, the guy who ended up coming in to play quarterback and transferred to Maryland from Alabama. And was really good and, and had a really good season, completed nearly 70% of his passes, nearly 4,000 yards, 26 touchdowns, and 11 interceptions. So a huge season for him. And then in 2022, which was last year, under Loxley, he had an 8-5 and five year and 4-5 and five finish in Big Ten play. But once again, Maryland finished fourth in the Big Ten in total offense, 400 yards per game. And despite, despite a overall dip in yardage, the Terps actually finished third in passing yardage. Uh, with 260 yards per game. Had 19 touchdowns, eight interceptions for Tagovailoa. And uh, once again, the ball is distributed to several wide receivers where six different players had over 300 receiving yards for Maryland. And that was his past year, and now he's at Arkansas. So I bring all that up to talk about his history and his stats and all of that to really just say this. The question becomes, is, is we, Dan Eno's going to be better at Arkansas and going to be a better offensive coordinator and have a better offense this upcoming season than what Arkansas had under Kendall Bryles last year? I don't know, <laughs> to be honest. But I will say that considering the type of high-quality talent that Dan Enos has had at quarterback is nothing short of impressive. Because even the 2018 year, we know in that one year, you had the three guys from Alabama that are all starters in the NFL. He coached Brandon Allen, who is Joe Burrow's backup in the NFL and has stayed in the NFL ever since he was drafted in 2015. So um, I don't care what anybody says. Is he a perennial starter? No, but not many people can do that. The fact that he's still in the NFL and being a backup for a team that was in the Super Bowl last year and just had a huge playoff win this past weekend to possibly get back to the Super Bowl if they win the AFC title is huge, too. You throw in also Talia Tagovailoa, who was highly regarded coming out of high school. And now people are feeling like he might be able to uh, take a next step. He's coming back to Maryland for another year, I believe. 
So he could end up being really good for Arkansas or for Maryland and uh, maybe he can get drafted, maybe do well. But the point is, is that he's had a lot of guys that he's coached at the NFL level, like, and has gotten, not, is he the one reason why they got to the NFL? I know, but he was a part of it. And when you have a resume of that many great quarterbacks and going to schools like Arkansas, like Bama, like Miami, like Maryland, like Cincinnati, those things really start to pile up and shows that whatever it is that he is doing or whatever he is and however his style is of coaching, it works and it translates. So the thing is, is what he's going to have at Arkansas next year is he's going to have, once again, another high-quality quarterback in K.J. Jefferson. I think that uh, if you talk to some other SEC experts, some may say that K.J. Jefferson is the number one, maybe number two quarterback returning in the SEC or going to be in the SEC preseason heading into next year probably means he still won't get added to the uh, sec uh, all sec team because it's really annoying that he wasn't but i don't see how you can't you can't leave him out this year you can't you just can't because he's he is that good and he's that gifted and as long as somebody like dan enos has a gifted quarterback in kj jefferson i think the sky's the limit and i think that especially when he has a dynamic group of running backs with rocket sanders being one of those that's just going to open up the passing game even more I think we're going to start to see a lot less of the hurry up and and, and get downfield and shotgun spreads and all that. Like there'll be an element of that on occasion, but I think it's going to be a lot more power and a lot more strength and a lot more physicality. And I think that there's going to be uh, a lot more innovation when it comes to how games are called. Because I went back and looked at a lot of Dan Eno's highlights when he was at Arkansas, and I get it. It was seven, eight years ago, so things change. But I looked at some of the plays that he had. Like, you think about late game situations too. Think about in 2015 in this, the you know, obviously the way that Brandon Allen played and going on the road and beating LSU like Arkansas did and being able to throw seven touchdown passes against Dak Prescott and Mississippi State at home. I know they lost that game, but the incredible feat that that was seven touchdown passes with no interceptions in a single game. You know, you think about what Arkansas did, um, you know, in that season against. You know, like uh, like they start off rough, as we all know, against Toledo and Texas Tech. But, you know, they went five and three in conference play and should have gone at least with the Mississippi State loss and the A&M loss, which it always did. They should have honestly gone seven and one. And even on against Bama on the road, they played really well. But then you even go to 2016. Remember that TCU game on the road and the, the ballsy play calls that were made at the end and how they finished that game in 2016. Think about the Ole Miss game in 2016. They finished that game. They had a drive down the field and they they finished it. They finished strong with it. So you think about that play, like they had times where in clutch situations when the game was on the line, they made plays and it worked out for them. Now, again, at the end of the year, you had the Missouri game and the 2017 season happened. To me, that was always more of a Brett Bielema thing. That was more of Brett Bielema just, you know, losing it and and losing the team and losing it all. But I think that because of what Enos provides and the type of coach that he will be, I would bet dollars to donuts that Arkansas's offense would be as statistic wise has high scoring and as many yards i don't know that's tough to tell but as far as in-game situations as far as timely play calling as far as going on being on the goal line and getting touchdowns when it's first and goal from the two instead of settling for field goals or coming up short those are the things i think arkansas is really going to improve on and that's going to be the difference this upcoming season as well Danny knows his contract also came out where he's getting $1.1 million with a $75,000 increase uh, following the next two years. So Arkansas got Dan Enos a lot cheaper than what Kendall Bryles was. And I uh, don't know Kendall Bryles' contract just yet for TCU, but I guess we'll have to wait and see on that one. Hmm. Still kind of funny to me. Folks, a small business owner or maybe a hiring manager, you know that success in 2023 all depends on the team members you surround yourself with. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs can help you find qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with those who have skills, values, experiences, and everything else to achieve those goals. LinkedIn Jobs helps you quickly attract qualified candidates to open jobs with targeting tools. They go beyond the resume data by using insights from your jobs post, company, and their 875 million member profiles to put your post in front of the most qualified candidates. That's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. So LinkedIn Jobs wants to help you find those candidates. They want to help you find them 
and talk to them faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free terms and conditions to apply. You are locked on Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the locked on podcast network, your team every day. All right, so moving on with the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. Hey, the Razorbacks got a win in basketball. How about that? How about that? They beat Ole Miss at home. It was so appreciated and so timely and desperately, desperately, desperately needed. Uh, I'm not going to try to sit here and tell you that this is a huge win and this is a game-changing win, that the season's just going to be turned around and everything's going to be Sunshine and rainbows all the way out because I'll be honest, Ole Miss is a bad basketball team. Like they are not good. There's a reason why they're nine and ten on the season now. Uh, they're one and six, but they're just not a quality basketball team. And Arkansas is trying to get back to that point where they can become a good quality basketball team. And honestly, this was the type of game that Arkansas needed to play. First off, shout out for the officials in making this game so much more pleasant to watch instead of the previous three ones. Because if you look at total fouls called in this game, folks, my goodness, it was incredible. Only, only, only 33 fouls. Wow. That's that's pretty nice. Only 30 free throws taken between the two teams? Wow. That's pretty nice. Um, it must have been the teams playing differently, or maybe it was Arkansas playing different defense. It wasn't. But I digress. Razorback basketball, though, they, they did a great job. And I think that uh, a few of the players were really key in this. You had four players in double figures for Arkansas. Anthony Black, I mean, it, it's incredible where I know he's had his games where he struggled, just like everybody this year has had their games where they've struggled. But, man, when he is on, when he's on his A game, th there's just uh, there, there's just nobody, nobody really better at what he does. Okay, so get this. Anthony Black scores 17 points in this game, 7 of 17 from the field. He goes 3 of 6 from free throw line. That was a little frustrating, but get this. He has eight assists, five steals, and three rebounds. That's incredible. That is absolutely incredible. I mean, that's that's a plus minus of 21. It shows you that, man, when he, he's got so many elements to his game that when he's on, he's just as good as anybody. So he had an awesome game. Uh, you throw in also uh, Jordan Walsh. Good to see him build upon what he did over at Missouri. I know he was perfect, and he got fouled out of that game. 12 points in 13 minutes, but this time around, just so much better. He had 13 points, seven rebounds, a steal in this game, too. Did turn over three times, but uh, played all 40 minutes of this game, the entire every second of it. Uh, didn't go one of three from free throw line, but did have two threes made. And just, uh, yeah, it's good to see him starting to get some confidence going there, too. But the ones that came off the bench, and in particular, in this case, Joseph Pinion, has another great game for him. 13 points. 13 points for Joseph Pinion. Goes 5 of 10 from the field. 3 of 6 from three-point land. Exactly what you need out of him. And he also pulled in five rebounds and had a steal and a block. So really good performance out of him coming up. Man, if you could just count on him or somebody just do that a little bit more often, it'd be great. But it's like I talked about the first part when we uh, saw Joseph Pinion do what he did against Missouri the first time that they played in Bud Walton Arena and he had that big game, it's like, that doesn't mean it's going to happen every time. It's great when it does, but doesn't mean it's always going to. And and he was just somebody that really opened up a lot of different things for Arkansas. So a great game out of Pinion. Uh, Mikel Mitchell also had 13 points in this game. Uh, or no, sorry, his plus and minus was 13, but uh, he had a nice game too. Uh, and in the limited time that he was in there, as well as Mikel Mitchell, uh, or sorry, I was looking at Mikel Mitchell. I always get mixed up. Makai Mitchell in this game had four points. Mikel Mitchell had four points as well, but both of them made really good minutes, didn't have uh, a whole lot of mistakes in this one too, especially uh, with Mikel getting five rebounds uh, in this game. But also Devo. Devo maybe had his best offensive game, 16 points, uh, six of 11 shooting. He had three threes as well. He went three of five from three-point land, five rebounds for him, four assists, uh, a steal, and uh, had a really, really nice game offensively there, too. Council struggled. Luckily, you didn't need him big in this game, but he only played 18 minutes, went one of six from the field, uh, did not do great, only two points, uh, had three turnovers and one rebound. So, yeah, just not a, not a great game out of him, but still, you saw some progress made. The, the team's offense is getting so much better. Like It, it is so much better. 
And the the offense overall has just become a lot more pleasantly like and, and easier to watch. Again, it's not perfect by any stretch. And again, I know Ole Miss is terrible. But just in the past three games alone, well, they lost two of them. The offense has been so much better. And so you're hoping that they can continue to build on this and get better and better. The free throw shooting was awful in this game where you shot almost as incredible as you possibly could against Missouri. And then you go in this game, you shoot 52%. Terrible. Nine of 17. Cannot happen. But you had 14 assists, only 11 turnovers. Uh, you had 12 steals in this game. So you're really getting after it. Uh, you had some... Your fast break points still struggling. Like that's bad. Seven points on fast breaks. They can't do a very good fast break. That some you guess you're just going to have to deal with as the year goes on. But Arkansas led in this game by 21 points at one point, and uh, really just uh, took care of business. Even though Ole Miss tried to make it an interesting run down the stretch. So uh, good, good game for Arkansas. And great to get back on the winning side of things. And they have LSU coming up uh, tomorrow, Tuesday night. So that'll be a that'll be a very important game and a huge game for many different reasons because again you got to win your home games. LSU's not a good team. They have one conference win this year and it's against you, <laughs> and that you shouldn't have lost that game. So this is one that Arkansas needs and should win, and uh, they then get back on track and get to that point to where they have three conference wins, be three and five. You know, you slowly but surely get back into the mix on some things too. So uh, I like it though. I like what the, we saw and I like the direction that hopefully it continues to go. And the coolest thing about it, I even tweeted this out, it was after the game. I saw that uh, when I was da- or there waiting on the post-game show to start, uh, where I do the post-game show on 103.7 The Buzz, I was just looking down and I saw on the court, it was way after everybody left, I saw <laughs> Nick Smith. And Nick Smith was down there just, uh, you know, putting up some shots. And I was in there watching him and he was there, and he had 28 of 32 three-pointers, which I know that it's it's nobody was on him. It's in practice and everything, but every made that he had was just pure, pure, pure. And I just kept watching. I'm like, man, he doesn't look like 100% ready to go. I like, I'm not trying to say that he's going to go against LSU or anything like that. I have no idea. But I'm just looking at him. I'm like, he's going to play. He's, he's getting there. He's getting better. He's getting more comfortable. He's going to play. And I just don't know when it's going to be, but it's just good to see him there. Good to see him getting some shots up and, and looking some, looking really good doing it as well. We will give you an update, a very important update on Peyton Hill. It's coming up next here on the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Okay, so final segment here on the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. Some really good news about Peyton Hillis. As we know, the story of him uh, where he had to go to the hospital and was put into ICU trying to save his kids from drowning. A very heroic story, and he was in bad shape. I mean, his kidneys were really having issues with the amount of uh, sand that apparently was in his body and uh, just a really nasty situation. Well, had a great thing and a great post uh, put up on Instagram, and I'll put it up here on the YouTube uh, video here too. It's a picture of uh, some family members of Peyton Hills as well as Peyton Hills in the hospital surrounded by doctors where it says, quote, God is so good. Peyton has been discharged from the hospital. The amount of love and gratitude I have for the incredible team that took care of Peyton is indescribable. Uh, it also says the picture does not have anywhere near the amount of people who took such great care of them at the Baptist Hospital in Pensacola. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I know I told you this probably 20 times a day, but you are incredible. You all worked like a perfected machine with each and every one of you so kind, attentive, calming, and caring. You not only saved Peyton's life, you made it a priority to make sure that he and his family were okay amidst your busy schedules. You were also calming, answered every question numerous times, and heck, even took care of me and measured that I was okay every night. Got hot tea from my throat, made sure that I was sleeping and eating, gave me for a friend to confide in. I mean, I am just in awe. Uh, goes on to say that you have all become a huge family to me, and I know that uh, you all made a difference in our lives. I can't wait to express this enough when I say this. Thank you for making all the difference in our lives. I'll never be able to thank you enough. And a huge thank you again to your prayers, love, and support. God heard, and he answered. So great to see that picture there. Great to see that picture with uh, the, the not only the doctors there, but Peyton smiling, and looks like he's doing better, and now he gets to go home. So great to see, and uh, it's great to know that for, for all that happened and, and him being on the road to recovery makes it uh, that much better where you think about what he did and saving his children and obviously uh, being able to, to get out of it with, uh, at least at this point in time, no serious damage and be able to recover and go back home 
is, is just awesome. And it, again, it kind of throws me off as far as, uh, well, not throws me off. It just makes me very interested in just how sometimes where it's pretty incredible to know some of the things that have happened here recently in sports with major injuries and surgeries and scary moments and everything, just to see, you know, people be able to, to come back in a way that you wouldn't have been able to 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. I mean, it's just amazing the way that modern medicine has uh, really gotten to the point to where it's at. You know, you think about DeMar Hamlin, that guy was at the Bills game uh, and, and the playoffs over the weekend. He was there waving, or at least it's hard to see because of all the snow, but he was there. You know, there's a guy that just a couple of weeks ago, a lot of people were thinking that, he, I mean, there's a chance he may not even make it. So the way to recovery and how things go in some cases is just awesome where you mix in, you know, the power of the modern medicine, uh, the power of the will of the person and the power of prayer to all go into it uh, really has a lot of great results to go along with it too. So just really great things for Peyton Hillis and, Hopefully uh, he continues to recover and hopefully we get to hear from him very soon. It's an awesome thing for sure. Appreciate everybody listening into Locked on Razorbacks podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or on Google Play. You can also get after me on Twitter at Buzz John Neighbors for any questions, comments, concerns that you may have. We'll keep it going from there. Same podcast time, same podcast channel tomorrow afternoon. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you then.